Welcome to another Sinistral Sunday on InRange TV. Today I'm going to be taking out the Armson ACS-21 to the Rio Black Rifle Match. Armson is best known for the OEG, the occluded eye gun sight, that used a fiber optic with both eyes open to superimpose a red dot over the shooter's field of view. Uh, this was made well before electronic red dot sights were on the market. The ACS-21 is a contemporary of the earliest ACOGs. From speaking to the people at Armson, these were first made sometime in the late 1980s, and we might have an interview with them on the channel in the future. But today I'm going to focus on the features of the ACS-21 and then how I do with it on the clock at the Black Rifle Match. The ACS-21 is a fixed four power combat style optic with a rugged extruded aluminum body that is hard coat anodized. The reticle is a post style reticle similar to that used in the SUSAT site and it does have illumination of the reticle via tritium. While there are Picatinny mounts available for the ACS-21, I thought it would be best to use it mounted to the top of a carry handle, as would have been the case when the optic was first developed in the 1980s. There is a hole through the bottom of the mount, so you can use your iron sights underneath the optic if you wish, but your field of view will be very limited, just as it is using an ACOG or Colt scope in a similar fashion. Here's what the sight picture of the ACS-21 looks like. The glass is very clear and you can see that the post stands out very well and ends in a very fine tip. Be aware though, there is no adjustable focus. So if your eyes aren't perfect and you're not wearing the right prescription, you might see the post slightly fuzzed out at the top. Eye relief is 1.6 inches, which is about what you would expect for an optic of this type. The objective lens is 32 millimeters and the field of view is seven degrees. The ACS-21 weighs in at 14.3 ounces. I'm using it on one of my retro build KP-15s with DMR trigger. It has a 20 inch non-free floated barrel with standard A2 handguards. I have a Harris bipod mounted to the handguard with an adapter as would have been the case in the early 1990s. I have just a regular A2 flash hider on the muzzle. I'll be using this in stealth division which allows for compensators multiple optics, including the variables and red dots mounted together at the same time, but magazines are limited to 30 rounds. So I will be at quite an equipment disadvantage in this division, but I felt it was the most appropriate division to use this early 1990s, late 1980s style DMR. T1 is at about 60 to 70 yards, T2 is at about 90 yards, T3 is at about 200, and the two silhouettes are about 300. From the start box, the shooter has to get three hits on T1, then step outside the start box and get three more hits. One thing I always notice when using carry handle mounted optics is that my shot to shot recovery time is slightly slower. And this is because my head is floating above the stock versus buried into it that helps control recoil and returning the sight picture to center. Here, the advantage of a free float tube becomes evident. Pulling into the barricade to better support and stabilize has the effect of pulling me off target to the right. I end up having to hold far right to make the hits at 300 yards on the silhouettes. I burn up quite a lot of ammo and time figuring this out though. I eventually send a round into the dirt so I can see where my rounds are hitting compared to my sight picture more easily. And then I know to hold that way when shooting at the target. Three more hits on the close steel between positions. This isn't a great position to deal with more bore offset. I have to push my body up higher to be able to see through the sight. Keep in mind, I zeroed this rifle from the bench with the bipod deployed. I have the bipod removed for this stage because it wouldn't have been useful in any of these positions and would have actually been a hindrance. But here again, I'm trying to figure out where I'm hitting versus my point of aim. And when I eventually do figure that out, getting the second target at 300 yards is simple. T1 through 3 are relatively close, somewhere between 50 to 75 yards. T4 is at a mid-distance of about 225 yards. T5 is at 300, and T6 is at just under 400. From this first position, we're going to see one of the problems with having more bore offset. I have a completely clear sight picture when engaging this third target, but my muzzle is actually covering the berm. I'll try to reposition and elevate my sights here and shoot over the berm, but it's not working. So eventually I just have to stand up to clear the berm 
and make the hit on that third target. This stage was choose your own adventure. You could pick any two of the props to shoot from. I didn't want to use the ladder, so I run through the depression there up to this barricade. T4, that 225 yard target is going to give me the most problems on this stage. It is the smallest target relative to the distance we are shooting at and I really can't tell where I need to hold to make the hits. Eventually, I'm going to move on from engaging it and onto the 300 and 400 yard targets, and I'm going to come back to make a hit on it at the end. Back onto T4, I'm going to use the rest of my magazine to try to hit it. It's not worth reloading, and there's a par time of 120 seconds anyway on these stages. What I consistently find when using this rifle configuration is man-sized targets are no problem. Two-thirds size targets are challenging but doable, but half size targets are a real nightmare to deal with. This is a very simple stage. There are seven MGM flash targets at 70 to 50 yards away from the shooter, and they will be engaged from three positions. While I did zero at 50 yards, I do still have to learn my holds at 70 yards from the start position. The more bore offset you have, the more divergence in point of aim versus point of impact throughout the flight of the bullet. The second position, the shooter just has to be touching the rooftop prop. Some people sat down and used their knees for support, leaning up against the roof. I didn't think getting into position was worth it. My hit ratio from here is better as I'm closer to where my zero is and I'm learning more about where I need to hold to hit the targets. This final position is going to be the best though with the bipod deployed and the targets at 50 yards. This is exactly how I zeroed the gun. On this stage, there are a variety of hanging steel targets at 50 to 250 yards. On the pairs of targets, I'll be engaging the left target first. I have to engage all the left targets and the array of six hanging targets, then go back across engaging the right targets as well as the six hanging targets again. The stage is again the exact conditions I zeroed the rifle for, shooting off the deployed bipod. Accordingly, my hit ratio is probably the best on this stage, and the misses I make are me trying to go too fast or not knowing the hold on a particular distance and having to adjust fire after seeing where the impact was. It's worth noting that the 225 to 250 yard targets on this stage are actually smaller at distance than the one I was engaging on one of the previous stages that I had a very hard time with. Reloading for the last target is always annoying, but at least the reload was smooth. On this stage, there are paper shoot targets surrounded by no shoot and three silhouettes at about 300 yards up the hill that must be engaged from two different positions. Shooter starts seated in the car and has to grab their rifle and load it on the clock. I end up going one for one on the rifle targets from this position. While I am getting more comfortable with the rifle, and particularly the optic, the more I use it, I think that was a bit of good luck as well. From back here, I end up dealing with the deflection issue again from supporting the rifle against the frame. Again, once I figure out where I need to hold, hitting the other targets isn't an issue. I am going to shoot this stage a second time to get some better video and also see if I can do it any faster.
I don't go one for one from back here, but my hit ratio inside the chopper is going to be a lot better than the first time. This angle will give you a much better idea of how I was supporting from this position inside the chopper. While this run doesn't count for score, I end up about five seconds faster just because I know where to hold better from this position. In the end, I'm 11th out of 32 shooters in stealth division with 78.38% of the winner's score. Overall, I'm 25th out of 72 shooters with 61.35% of the winner's score. Familiarity with equipment matters much more than the equipment itself with regards to performance. Aside from the second stage in the results here, you can see that my score is trended towards doing better with my last stage being my best stage of the match. Could I continue to get better with this configuration? Absolutely. Would I ever be able to compete at the same level versus modern free-floated guns and modern optics with better reticles mounted closer to the bore? Absolutely not. Viewed through the context of the late 1980s or early 1990s, would I prefer this setup over a stock M16A1 or M16A2 to hit targets at distance? Absolutely yes. I'd like to thank Armson USA for loaning me the ACS-21 that I used in this video. They are available for sale in limited numbers if you're looking for a unique period optic to put on your retro build. If you like this kind of content, consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you for watching.